Welcome to Founders of Friends podcast with Scott Orn at Cruise Consulting. And today, my very special guest is Michael Frankel of Trajectory Capital. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. You are, I think you're, this is your second time on the podcast. You are yeah. incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, I'll, we'll do your background real fast, but you, we're going to talk about something I think is super interesting, which is should VC back companies that aren't going to be a unicorn or an IPO be thinking about private equity as a funding source? And spoiler alert, I think the answer is yes. Uh, that's why we're doing the podcast, but maybe give everyone your background so they know where you're coming from on this and then we'll get into it. Sure. Sure. So, um, Short version of my background, I've sort of done deals from every direction. I was an M&A lawyer, M&A banker, ran corporate development for a bunch of big uh, tech and information services companies, uh, CFO of small tech companies that were taking in venture money. Um, and now I'm, uh, I'm the founder of an investing firm, uh, Trajectory Capital. Um, and over the course of my career, I've done about 110 transactions, mostly, though not exclusively, in the sort of mid-size range, uh, think, uh, you know, purchase price of 20 million to 300 million. Which is, I mean, that's, that's a very, especially at the high end of that range, that's a great outcome for pretty much every company. You know, Absolutely. if you haven't taken a hundred million dollars of capital, if you sell for 300, you're in great shape. And yeah, yeah. that's kind of where we want to talk because I, we know each other because we, I, we worked together when I was at Hamburg Quist, you're at Network Solutions been friends for a long time and you've bought so many of these like really good companies, but maybe not VC funded in the first place, or maybe they're VC funded for a couple rounds, but, but weren't really putting up the growth rates that made them the next Uber. Yeah. And, yeah, I think that's right. and, and you were like, before we turn on the microphones, you had a really good way of thinking about the world. You wanted to kind of repeat it. So for the, for the audience here. Yeah. So, so, you know, it, and this is, it, I guess it's my way of thinking about the world. More importantly, it's actually the way the world works based on data. Um, the, the vast majority of companies end up in the middle of the bell curve, right? So very few companies are unicorns. Very few companies become massive public. Very few companies go public. Um, there's a larger number of companies that go bankrupt, but the, the, the beefiest part of the world, especially when you get past sort of deals that, you know, companies that failed before they even started. Once you get past that, companies that actually started to generate revenue, the vast majority sit in the middle, right? They, they don't grow to billions of dollars in revenue. They don't go bankrupt. They produced a real product that adds real value to real customers, but, you know, they're not going to generate billions of dollars of revenue or value. Um, and, and frankly, I've spent my career buying those companies, which have real value to them, um, but they're worth, 70 million they're worth 130 million they're worth 210 million um that's that's sort of the i feel like that's the part of the market that people aren't paying as much attention to um and you know sort of a, a, a lot of venture back companies have this initial aspiration to get huge which is great but the reality is a lot of them are going to peel off and some of them are going to go bankrupt and that sort of you know if, if it was a Flawed business model, flawed technology, something changed in the market, that's fine. But for a lot of them, they built something that's really valuable. It's really useful. Clients want it. It's just not going to be massive. Um, and I think people don't spend enough time thinking about those companies or what they do after, after you know, there's that fork in the road, right? Oh, this was a horrible mistake and it's a failure. Let's shut it down and move on. This is massive and it's rocketing like a rocket ship. Okay, if neither of those two things happen, you're somewhere in the middle. And the other thing I'd add to that, which I think you said perfectly, is it's been a long – VC funds are raising a lot of funds rapidly, over like one every year, one every two years. It used to be like every four or five years. And yeah. I've been around long enough to see times in the market where the VC funds get tired. And so you – tired meaning they're a 10-year fund and they're year eight of that fund. And they don't really have investable capital left. Or if they do, they have a sliver of money left. And they have to use it to protect like their number one or number two companies. Yeah. And so yeah. at Lighthouse, when I was at the venture lending firm, mm -hmm. um, I we would actually find these companies sometimes and do like really, really attractive deals for us with them. And attractive to the VCs because they couldn't write another check. Right. And attractive to the management team because their constant battle when you're in that situation is you're undercapitalized. 
you yeah. can never get more money. So there'd be all, we did like a bunch of these 10 or companies had 10 or $15 million in revenue growing at like 20% a year or something like that. So not a VC growth rate right? For, for the next round, but like a very good business with tons of enterprise value and something the founders had spent, you know, five or six years of their life on. And, and we would just hop in there, re, recapitalize them a little bit. We would, the whole equity stack would stay the same, but the company would have money to grow. And we knew there was very little risk. And so I've seen this and I think this is going to happen again. I think right now we're in this you know, still kind of maybe don't, there's so many people that were new in venture capital over the last three or four years. They don't maybe even know this pattern is going to happen. Um, and I think these companies, frankly, should be thinking about funds like yours that look for this, look for that kind of profile and can get the VCs out whole or even make them some money if they buy it. The management shouldn't really care what their capital stack is as long as it's functional and allows them to grow. Right. And the management team gets to live their life and build their company and build their dream. I, th I feel like it's a win-win for everybody. I, I think it is. And I, I'd say a couple of things. Number one, I think year eight is a conservative number. I think a lot of funds yeah. <clears throat> in any market, but especially in a market like this, make that decision about portfolio companies earlier. Um, even if they still have capital to deploy, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. in a market like this, they're making choices, right? And yeah, as I said before, you have the companies that really should shut down. You have the companies that are still massive potential home runs we want to put capital into. But there are these companies in the middle. And I would argue the VCs have a number of problems. The first problem is they don't want to put any more money behind this company, but the company needs more capital. The second problem is they don't want to write off these companies um, because Great they're point. still That's part value. of it. Yeah, and then the and then the third is, um, frankly, because you know I think VCs are humans and they develop personal relationships with these management teams. It's awfully hard to tell a management team that's been working their hearts out, doing a good job, but for reasons that really aren't in their control that have to do with market dynamics, that have to do with the nature of the customer. Um, they're not going to be a gigantic unicorn. It's awfully hard to tell those people, hey, remember, we've been partners for five years. We've been working together. I'm abandoning you now, right? I'm, 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 I'm walking away. Um, or, or at the very least, I can't put any more money into you. And I probably want to step down off your board because I can only sit on so many boards. I got to focus my, my efforts. So for the VC, this is a great outcome because their portfolio company gets another investor who can give the company the time they need, can sit on the board, can be engaged, can provide capital, can do all those things that they're going to be able to do less of because they have to shift their attention. Um, and for the management team, you know, if you set aside the stages of grief exercise of recognizing the fact that you're in this situation, and we can talk about that, this is a great outcome because A, you get capital. B, you get an engaged investor and you get an investor who actually has a different skill set that's more attuned to your situation, right? If you're a five, ten million dollar revenue company that's now growing at more like 30 percent a year, um, you no longer need as many of the skill sets that the venture team brought to you, right? Yeah. Understanding how to start up a business and understanding how to hyper accelerate. Instead, you need more, frankly, private equity kind of expertise. How do I fine tune the engine? How do I optimize pricing? How do I hire on management teams? Stuff like that. So you're actually swapping out for a new investor who sort of focuses on companies that look more like you do right now. Yeah. Um, and so everyone is gonna be more successful under that scenario. And more importantly, I don't think this is a choice. In other words, I think that a lot of companies are going to be faced with their VCs saying, we, we, we can't do your next round. So yeah. you're going to have to go somewhere else. And fellow VCs are not going to do the next round for the same reason, which is you're not a you're not a rocket ship and we're a rocket ship factory. Yep. You're, there's so many great things you're saying there. I can't like even recap all of it. But that whole um, not wanting to write it down is a real thing. 
Yeah. Very real. Because if you're trying to raise another venture capital fund in a much tougher market, it's it's painful to write these companies down because your net asset value that you Absolutely. show prospective LPs and your existing LPs is lower. Yeah. Um, everyone's sitting on like high net asset values right now because the portfolio has been marked up by following rounds and things like that. There's also something you said, which I really want to, it, it's connected to what I've seen. Venture capitalists, as you said, are human. They don't want to write it down. They know they're not going to be able to get more money from them or someone else. So they they basically starve the company. I've seen this mm -hmm. many times. They just cut to the bone, cut to the bone, cut to the bone. And yeah. it's very frustrating for a management team. And they have an opportunity cost of their career, right? They're spending their years working on this. How have you seen a management team help the venture capitalists navigate the stages of grief? And how to let go and how to that, I actually think that might be the most important thing. It's it's really interesting. I, I think part of this, I mean, let's separate it into two pieces. The first is that the incentives are not aligned, right? I think most VCs, because they are home run hitters, are not as focused on how do I turn a strikeout into a single. They're really focused on how do I turn a triple into a home run. And so I think Part of it is that they just don't, they're not focused on that kind of an outcome. Um, but I do think that part of this is management going to the VC and getting them to understand on the one hand, and this is a hard conversation, right? Because you've collectively spent the last X number of years talking about how you can achieve massive success, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the premise of the relationship. So now you have to come to them with a totally straight face, say, we're in the middle. We're, we're not going to achieve this massive success, right? Yeah. We all collectively got that wrong. There's not as much of an addressable market yeah. as we thought. There's not as much price strength, whatever, whatever that reality is. It's reality. We all have to come to grips with it. I'm, but, I'm smiling here because it's, it's like everyone wish, around the table wishes they wouldn't have been wrong. But that's just how it worked out. And so, yeah, that, that's, you know, that's it right. is what it is. That's life. It that's is what, what it is. And, you know. and what I find frustrating is, Statistically, it is by far the most likely outcome, right? Yeah. We, we we do not have, you know, hundreds of Googles out there. It's it's a rare that that's the rare outcome, but it's the outcome they're focused on. So step one is look, we we're, we're not going to be that, but we've created a lot of value with your money and our blood, sweat, and tears, and that value is not going to zero, right? That value is there. We have to figure out how do we maximize that value, and that's important for us because it's our life's work and and it's our it's our you know our, our all our wealth is tied up in this. It's also important for you because yes, this is not going to be a 100x or a 500x or a 1,000x outcome, but this could still be a 5x outcome for you, yeah. 3x yeah. outcome for you, right? Um, even even a one x outcome for you, which is way better than a zero x, right? So yes, it's not what you focus on, but now now that we've established that we're not going to have that outcome, how do we optimize this asset, right? Because it's still it's still a very valuable asset to you, and let we we understand this is the the company talking to the VC. We understand that this is not what you focus on. You don't focus on companies like what we have now determined our company is, but we want your support and your help to maximize your returns and also maximize our, you know, our, our lives. Um, and here's what we need you to do to do that. And frankly, I think a lot of VCs will be happy to hear this because number one, they don't want to have that conversation with founders, right? It's, yeah, that's it's a great flip point. side, right? Hey, I know I told you that you were the next, you know, Larry and Sergey, but you're not at least not with this company. Um, that's a tough conversation. And I, I go back to the VCs are humans thing. They don't want to walk away from management team. They, they know the management team is working hard. This yeah. isn't a question of effort, right? This isn't, yeah. this is a, this is just a question of outcomes. So being sort of in a weird way, let off the hook, we understand that you're going to, you know, you're, you're not going to invest in our next round. Um, you know, you're, you're probably going to step off our board. We totally understand that. And it's okay, right? Like we're not, we're not mad at you, but here's what you can do to help us. 
How do you how do you do how do you go forward with that? Like, do you get a mandate? Do you get a written mandate? Do you talk to them about the parameters of the deal? Do you shop shop the market a little bit before you talk to them, or do you wait because you don't want to piss them off? Like, how do you think about that mechanically? You know, I I think this comes down to interpersonal relationships. I'm not sure there's a definitive answer because I think it depends on the founder and depends on the VC. My bias is I, I'm I'm big into transparency. I just yeah. I I don't I don't have the I don't have the brain power to fake it. Um, and so I I would just come to a VC and go, look, here's where we are. Right, here's the likely trajectory of our business. You know, are are you interested in funding that? And when they go, no, you know, it's not understood. I expected that. I'm going to go out and find other capital. We all know that capital is going to be heavily dilutive to you, right? We're going yeah. to have to come down off of valuation. They're going to want preference. They're going to want control. They're probably going to want your board seat. And I just want to make sure that we're aligned, that that's and, – and if you have a better idea, great, right? If you think I'm wrong and you want to put more money in the company, fantastic. But yeah. if not – I'm so I wouldn't try to set parameters because the answer is it's going to be whatever the market bears. The market. I don't want, yeah. and, and frankly, I don't want the VC. You know, unless the VC has the relationships, you know, it, which by the way, as a side note, is is a, a really a real potential outcome. I, I think a lot of VCs know growth equity and private equity folks. Um, so you know, I, but I I think pre planning what the terms are going to be is pointless, right? The yeah. market will be what it'll be. So instead, yeah. you sort of reach an agreement about the reality of your situation. And then you go, okay, let's collectively go out and see what 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 we can come up with in terms of the best economic terms and also the best partner for the company, just like we did with our VC, right? We chose you, Scott, as our yeah. VC partner because not just because of your money, but because we worked well together and you could be helpful to us. Now we're going through that exercise again with more of a private equity mindset. Um, and we'd like your help doing that. I think that's the right way to do it because the reality is what, what are you going to set some kind of an arbitrary valuation? And then you discover that the, the private equity guys coming in below it, you know, yeah. you, I, I think, I think trying to set expectations is bad. I would yeah. just say, this is what we are going to do and we want your support in doing yeah. it. Like a license to hunt basically. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, also the the other big thing is it depends on who owns what, right? If the VC owns eighty percent of the company, it's a different conversation than if VC, the VC owns twenty percent of the company. That's very true. Uh, do you ever see in, in these type of deals? Do you see the VCs rolling some of their equity value over and writing a small check if there's a a, a credible PE lead, or or do they usually just want to get out, or does the private equity want the other investors out? Like how's that so usually work? I don't think the I don't think the private equity investor will want any investors out, right? Because they, you know, unless they're taking unless they're buying control. So if they want control, then yeah, they'll probably yeah. want to take out the non-managers and the non-founders. But if they're just coming in for additional capital, what you know, speaking, why would I want I want the VC to continue to be in? They have a long history with the company, they can yeah. still be helpful. So I, I think that um, yes, I, I, I think you don't see sort of liquidity. On the other hand, I think it's probably unusual for the VC to put in any money because the whole premise of this is that the company is now off strategy for the VC. So in a, in a way, yeah. I would find it strange if I came to a company that was VC backed and they were doing a, making something up there. They're doing a $4 million round and the VC goes, well, I'll put in 1 million. If it's a big VC, my question is, wait a second. If one million is on strategy, why wouldn't you just why why am I even yeah. at this table? So, I was I was just thinking like maybe they're they can it's like a signal that they care, but they really tied on cash basically because they're you know they're at yeah. their but yeah, yeah I think I mean, you're right. I think you're right. Sure, like, if they if they're willing to do that, that's fantastic. Yeah. My guess is if the VC has bucketed this as a we're not gonna invest any more in it, they're probably holding to that. Um yeah. That makes sense. That, and I'm, I'm also thinking, how do you as a private equity firm or folks like you navigate the um, venture capitalist who does have money but tells the founder to go out there and what find out what this company is worth and then they kind of turn around and if you give them a term sheet, they turn around and just do, do it themselves. Like basically getting you to – is that just like yeah. – 
part of doing business. That's just a, the cost of doing business. If, as I a, mean, I'd say a, a yeah, the cost of doing business, right? Deals don't always turn out. There's no yeah. guarantee. Um, I'd also say that's an awfully weird behavior because you can price, especially, you know, in the pri in the world of lower growth businesses, especially in the world of lower growth, profitable technology businesses, um, you, you don't need to find some random private equity firm to provide an offer like the market. You, you were a banker, you, you know, th th there's enough market data that I can probably price the company, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. if I have a portfolio, if I'm a VC and I have a portfolio company that is now a 30% growth SaaS business in a certain sector, I, I don't need some private equity firm to tell me what that's worth. I, I can probably figure out what it's worth. So if my only goal is to reset valuation expectations of the management team, but I'm still going in, I think I can do that in other ways, unless the valuation, unless the management team is in total denial. Yeah. Um, I've where I've seen it is there's different opinions at the VC level, like multiple VCs right. in a company and they can't agree. Yeah. Um, and then, so, you know, it's like almost like break the tie kind of thing. Right. You know? Right. So, but so I also got to believe you, you got to be pretty good at detecting that kind of stuff. Like your spider senses go off probably a little bit and you're like, Oh, this, this isn't a real, these guys aren't really actually looking to sell or looking to recapitalize right. the company. They're just kind of, you know, farting around here. So, so I think number one, yeah, your spider sense goes off because it's rare that someone will lie directly to your face. So if I go talk to a, a VC who's an investor and I go, so, so why are you not investing going forward? And they go, well, you know, we haven't made that decision, but we're, th you know, if they don't go, here's my reason and I'm not investing. Okay. Now I know that you're still on the fence. Yeah. The other thing yeah. Is, it's not necessarily a bad outcome for this reason. They may still want me to come in. So maybe the answer is we're raising $8 million and we're going to take the original investors are going to take 4 million, but we want you to come in for, for another four. Yeah. A, because they want to diversify their, their risk. But B, I go back to the same thing I was saying at the beginning, which is this is now a different company, a 30% totally fast yeah. company the VCs are not going to be able to be quite as helpful operationally. And so maybe you want me involved. You want me at the table, even if you're not leaving the table, if you, even if you're going to continue to invest, you want me at the table because you want me to bring that skill set that I have to help what I'd call medium growth, you know, technology businesses. And that's worth you letting me into the cap table. Yeah, I totally agree. And maybe it frees them up from a board seat, you know, and they only have so much time in the day and, but they still have a fiduciary looking after the company they trust and things like that. That's right. Yeah. Well, and, and even more so somebody who's sitting at the board, having the right conversations, right? They're used to having conversations about hyper growth. That's where they can add value in the board meeting. Now the conversation is about, you know, margin levels and yeah. channel partners and more modest growth kind of strategies. Maybe that's something that, you know, above and beyond the fact that they don't want to spend the time sitting on the board, I'd be better sitting on the board than they would because that happens to be where I'm a little stronger. I totally agree. What, let's switch gears a little bit, which is um, I don't think like maybe how, how like conceptually how can founders explore this? How do they look at the market, who they talk to? Because I also think there a lot of founders don't know how big private equity is. Like I just heard a stat yesterday, actually, that a trillion dollars of private equity was deployed last year, which guess what? Was a down year. Yeah. <laughs> that was a down year, a trillion dollars. So there's yeah. just, there's, for because cause we in the venture ecosystem tend to think like venture capital, it's humongous, da, 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 da. And at the peak, maybe, I don't even know, maybe there's 80 billion last year went in, but like, I bet you'll be like 40 this year, you know? Compare that to a trillion. It's 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 like mind-numbingly huge. There's yeah. tons of different strategies. There's tons of people looking for different markets and looking for different kinds of companies. I mean, it's the people are out there who will want to look at your company. How do, how should the founders navigate this and try to find folks like you? Yeah. So the, I think it's a big challenge. I mean, and it's a bigger challenge than an adventure because there's it's a more heterogeneous uh, population, right? Private equity plays in a bunch of industry sectors that venture doesn't play in, and private equity plays 
across a size range that that is is w even wider than venture yeah. right this yeah. is in a world where venture is writing 100 million dollar checks um so you know step one is you have to find pe's that are both size appropriate industry sector appropriate and stage appropriate for your company right that'll narrow the population radically right so if you're a SaaS business you know the first thing you can do is wipe out all the PEs that focus on consumer packaged goods and pharma and oil and gas and yeah, real estate, yeah. right? So, yep. and then size, um, because there are private equity funds that are writing $3 billion checks, right? Obviously they're not, um, and it's not even just that they're not interested in your company, they'd be physically incapable of doing a deal of your size. It's a yeah, totally yeah. different operation. Yep. So. Once you've narrowed it down, and then the last, the la last one is sort of core strategy, right? Which is you have private equity funds that are focused on everything from fairly high growth companies that sort of bounce up against venture levels of growth on one end of the spectrum, all the way to companies that are in bankruptcy or about to be in bankruptcy. So you have to match up the private equity fund strategy with your strategy. You don't want, if you're, you know, growing 20, 30% a year and you're doing well and you're marginally profitable, you don't want a private equity fund whose whole model is first we fire 30% of the workforce. Then we renegotiate all the contracts with all the outside vendors, right? We call up Scott at Cruise Consulting and go, you got to cut 40% off your bill or we're going to walk away. Like yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. That's a strategy that's appropriate when a company is about to hit zero. For your company, that's that that would actually be incredibly damaging. So industry sector, size, and sort of stage or nature of company is is how you find those folks. And then honestly, it's the same exercise as finding a VC. It's networking, it's talking to, you know, people in the industry, venture lenders, regular Banks. lenders. Banks know a lot of people because they, sometimes they're trying to sell a company that they've had to put in default. That's, That's right. a really good source. Yeah. Now, the, the good news is, well, here's the last one, industry sector people, because yeah. you want, a, just like you want a VC, probably even more so than you want a VC who understands your particular business, you definitely want a private equity fund that understands your particular business. So the center of the bullseye, if you are a supply chain technology company, is to find a, 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 a fund that's in your size range that has done some stuff in supply chain, right? They You usually can find that out too by just talking to your competitors or analogous businesses or like software vendors, tool vendors, bankers, like, like they kind of know, like they, they'll tell you who's buying companies, That's right. you know? Yeah, exactly. Or, or you'll have seen your competitors. If you're not the first player in the space to not become a rocket ship, you may have seen other examples of this. One of the challenges is that there's sort of a size issue um, because Private equity, just as venture has written bigger and bigger and bigger checks, private equity is writing bigger and bigger and bigger checks. So if you are a one to 20 million revenue technology business um, and you're looking for three, five, 10, 15 million dollars of capital, you are off strategy for a whole bunch of private equity funds because they just don't write checks that small, right? Yeah. The, and, and actually, here's a great shorthand filter test. Generally speaking, for any one fund um, in the private equity world, they're probably making, not including follow-on investments, they're probably making, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 investments. So if you are looking for a $10 million check, you probably can't go to a private equity fund that's much above a hundred, two hundred million dollars in that particular fund, right? Fund three, yeah. fund four, whatever. Yeah, yeah, is. yeah. Because your check will be too small. They'll often put on their websites what their check size is. But yeah, that's a good point. If they have a four billion people... dollar fund, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, say, if they have a four billion dollar fund, they physically can't write your ten million dollar check, no matter yeah. how much they like your company. So that's another way of filtering. The the other thing I was going, and we should probably wrap up here. Um, uh, this is a great conversation. 
um, is maybe you can explain this to people. A lot of private equity funds will buy what they call a platform company, which is like yeah. maybe the mothership in an industry or service provider or something like that. And then they, they do what's called tuck-in acquisitions. Can you explain that to the audience? Sure. Sure. So it's pretty straightforward, right? And and you've seen this in the real world. Venture companies just often are moving so fast and growing so fast that M and A is distract is too much of a distraction. But yeah, in 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 the sort of non venture world, companies do build by partner as an analysis for how they're going to expand, right? Uh, whether it's I need new features, I need new technology, I need to enter new geographies, I need new brands. Uh, whatever that thing I need is, they always think to themselves, I could acquire it, I could build it myself, or I could partner for it if I don't need to control it. And buy is often an option. So you'll often see private equity funds and private equity funds want to deploy more capital and they want to accelerate the growth of their companies. So the strategy is often, let me buy a core business that's well-run, management team I trust, um, you know, has the potential to be much bigger. And then arm them with the capital to do organic growth, but also give them the capital and usually get very actively involved because I'm a private equity guy, so I do deals for a living, um, in doing additional deals. Um, now, there's two kinds of, of these. One is just a roll-up, right? Where I'm buying just a whole bunch of the same thing, um, you know, uh, uh, dry cleaners, right? Yeah. I bought a, a company that has 50 dry cleaners, and then I'm buying a bunch of other family-owned dry cleaning uh, chains and gobbling it up. And the more complex one is tuck-ins, which is what you referred to, which is this new technology will add on features. Uh, this this gives me a European operation, yeah. stuff like that. And also like the the mothership acquisition, the platform company, the management team there usually knows exactly who they want to buy to fill whatever void. It's like it's like having yeah. it's like having the scout team come in right. and they, they already have a really good idea and they know how this could open up a region or a product or a service or a customer base. So it's, it's really they, synergistic. It's a great way of yeah. approaching things. Oh, absolutely. I, I would say to be, to be fair, they, they know a lot. They often don't know everything, but they're maybe 70% of the way there the day yeah. you acquire them. And then you help them get the other 30% yeah. of the way. And also, right? like you said, you have the private equity firm has, professional deal making strategies and professionals who know how to do stuff. They know how to do yeah. diligence. They know how to market size stuff and things like that. They can talk to a lot of people. So it's it's very helpful. It's yeah. It's, it's a really good strategy. I, I think let's wrap it up, but this is I really think and, and I'm excited to send this out to the cruise client base too, because there's so many great companies that we work with that have built something very substantial. Yeah. And, and maybe they're not going to IPO, but they are, they've built something of value and the investors through this pathway have a way of getting, making money. The management team certainly has a way of making money and building their business. And the, and the private equity front funds are there for a reason. There's, this is a real opportunity. Uh, absolutely. And I, that's, that's one thing I'd say to your audience, you know, this is a very tough time and if you started out thinking that you were just going to stay with your VC forever and you were going to IPO on the NASDAQ, um, it can be jarring to consider another path. But as, as somebody who spent his career paying really good money, life-changing money, hundreds of millions yeah. of dollars in a check for these businesses, you know, the 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 failure to IPO is not a failure. It's just a different path. And frankly, yeah. it's the most common path. Being acquired by much larger companies after taking private equity money is the most common liquidity path. The IPO is much more rare. So don't, you know, take a breath, but then don't view this as a, just view this as a fork in the road. Totally agree. If you've built something of value, you're still going to get value from it. Like you just need a different kind of partner. Um, all right, man, tell everyone where they can find trajectory and, uh, and we'll, and we'll wrap it up. And thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, uh, trajectory capital, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can also find me on michaelfrankel.com and, um, you know, uh, uh, keep heart, uh, every down market is followed by an up market. I, t I believe that to my to my bone i know i know that's true i've seen three huge down markets in my career and it always bounces back all right man great talking to you thanks so much good to see you man
。バイバイ。